The average American drinks about 2.3 gallons in pure alcohol each year. Keep in mind, that's pure alcohol, not the water in your wine or beer or liquor, just the alcohol in those drinks. Okay, now flashback 200 plus years, the earliest years of the American Republic. People drank so much back then. A drink when waking, a drink at the 11 a.m. work break, a drink with lunch, every meal for that matter, and nightcap before bed. Even children drank. W.J. Rorabau described mom and dad giving toddlers the quote, heavily sugared portion at the bottom of a parent's mug of rum toddy. I'm blown away by this anecdote Rorabau found in his book, The Alcoholic Republic. A traveler noted Quote, I have frequently seen fathers wake their child of a year old from a sound sleep to make it drink rum or brandy. I encountered an anecdote in a couple secondary sources that sums this up fairly well. Frederick Marriott wrote, quote, I am sure the Americans can fix nothing without a drink. If you meet, you drink. If you part, you drink. If you make an acquaintance, drink. If you close a bargain, you drink. They quarrel in their drink and they make it up with a drink. They drink not because it's hot, they drink because it's cold. If successful in elections, they drink and rejoice. If not, they drink and swear. They begin to drink early in the morning. They leave off late at night. They commence it early in life and they continue it until they soon drop into the grave. Each year, that drinking added up to around 5.8 gallons, 22 liters, of pure alcohol per person. That 5.8 gallons in 1790 was higher than 20 years earlier in 1770 when consumption was 3.5 gallons, which is still a lot. Not too long later, during the presidency of Andrew Jackson in 1830, that number went to the highest it would ever go. 7.1 gallons of pure alcohol per American per year on average. The average laborer was estimated to drink at least four ounces of spirits each day. Coincidentally, after Andrew Jackson's inauguration, there was a massive party that overran the White House. It got so rowdy that Jackson had to flee well-wishers out a window. The American founders were regular drinkers too. The Mayflower had a bunch of beer on it. George Washington even had a whiskey distillery. Despite their own regular drinking, the first three presidents were nonetheless concerned at increasing rates of overconsumption in the new country. Were the trend to continue Continue, the country would devolve to drunkards. What were people drinking? Mostly whiskey, rum, gin, and brandy, but those were often accompanied with beer, wine, and cider. Prior to the American Revolution, rum from the West Indies was common. Nearby British colonies supplied thirsty American colonists to their heart's content. When the war broke out, the British blockaded, and people were forced to ask, why is the rum gone? Cut off by the British barmen, Scottish and Irish immigrants came to the rescue. Cue the long American obsession with with whiskey. Where were people drinking? In taverns and at parties and in courtrooms and other public places? Yes, but most alcohol was consumed in the home. That was particularly true for women for whom drinking needed to be paired with holding up society's expectations of behavior. This was also to be carefully considered by enslaved people for whom laws limited and sometimes downright banned their consumption of alcohol. When did Americans drink? All the time, morning, noon, and night, for ordinary days and especially for holidays. They drank before work to open their eyes, at a lunch break to keep up spirits, in the afternoon to close a business deal, and in the evening before bed to close those same tired eyes once again. At election time, political candidates handed out free drinks. To resist passing out bottles of liquor to the masses at your events was to risk defeat at the polls. So yeah, Americans were drinking all the time. After the US achieved independence, settlers in Kentucky and Ohio made whiskey with burgeoning quantities of corn and their surpluses of rye, wheat, and barley barley when available. The surplus meant that even with federal taxation, whiskey was cheap, cheaper than other drinks like coffee or tea or other forms of alcohol. That doesn't mean farmers were pleased with the taxation of whiskey, see 1791's Whiskey Rebellion, but nonetheless, whiskey production and consumption grew in the first years of the independent United States and blew past rum in huge chunks. Whiskey wasn't just cheaper than water and tea, it was safer. At least in the short term, it was better for your health. Water supplies were often contaminated in cities or murky with sediment in rural areas. Private wells were often not tapped for public consumption and springs too distant to justify the arduous journey. People were straight up scared of water. Drinking it involved personal and societal friction. Alcohol did not. Well, what about milk? 
Interest in the safety of cow's milk has always been high, as many mothers have chosen not to breastfeed over the centuries. For a time, bacteria's role in making milk unsafe wasn't completely known, and many children died because of that ignorance. Pasteurization, the process by which milk is exposed to low heat to kill pathogens, became required in major American cities at the turn of the 20th century. The prioritization of making milk safer even landed on the desk of then Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover, who was quoted in Mark Kolansky's excellent book on milk history as saying, quote, Upon this milk industry, more than any other of the food industries, depends not alone the problem of public health, but there depend upon it the very growth and virility of the white race? Dang, maybe Herbert Hoover was drinking liquor in order to talk about milk. In any event, 100 years earlier, where our focus is, milk was just another dicey thing to drink. Even if it were of quality, a large number of people were lactose intolerant. So just give yourself and your baby whiskey. Problem solved. Next question, who was doing all this drinking? Well, okay, Americans, I've already given you the averages, but it's unlikely that the drinking was spread evenly across the population, and thus, the average amounts can be a bit misleading. For example, near America's alcoholic peak in 1820, again, according to W.J. Rohrabau, quote, half the adult males, one eighth of the total population were drinking two thirds of all the distilled spirits consumed. That said, despite the uneven distribution between person A drinking two drinks a day and person B drinking 16 drinks per day, everybody was drinking. Outsiders found the level of American drinking astounding, though noted the sheer quantity of drinking meant the average person was less belligerent due to high tolerance. Alexis de Tocqueville recounted in his famous 1830s observations of the United States that legislating against alcohol in the form of taxation was impossible. A different US visitor found that American alcohol consumption was stereotypically Irish in amount, but functional. It's an unfair assessment because Americans drink drank more than the Irish in 1830. Foreigners weren't the only ones astonished. A homegrown movement against society's drunkenness, the temperance movement, picked up steam in the 1830s and 40s. Early activists advocated something closer to a dictionary definition of temperance, moderation, or voluntary abstinence. For example, some of the first well-known temperance advocates were reformed drinkers themselves, the so-called Washingtonians. These men began their anti-alcohol advocacy in a Baltimore tavern and called on other drinkers to join them in abstention. But it it wasn't long before the temperance movement radicalized to advocate government policy that would restrict access to alcohol, the state of Maine became the first state to ban the production and sale of alcohol in 1851. A dozen other states tried similar laws. Aside from Maine, the cultural backlash to alcohol came before the movement to ban it. By 1850, alcohol consumption dropped in half. It wasn't an even distribution though. Half of the population simply stopped drinking. Other half continued unabated. By 1850, around 5 million anti-alcohol pamphlets were passed around the country, placing a wedge between those two halves of society. Many narratives about alcohol in America pause around this time, the 1850s and 60s, because of the Civil War. Indeed, alcohol use unsurprisingly went up as the Union and Confederacy fought between 1861 and 65. But the temperance movement picked back up in the decades after the Civil War, with women leading the charge. Many women activists made their name in this period. Eliza Mother Thompson, Frances Willard, Amelia Bloomer, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. There was a large deal of crossover between those advocating against alcohol and those advocating for women's suffrage. It's a logical funnel. In this period, American women had no right to control a house's finances, no right to divorce, no sexual protections within marriage. It's easy to see how a woman could be defenseless against alcoholic husbands and fathers. The path to rights at home went through political suffrage. Congress approved the 19th Amendment, which provided for the voting rights of women. Speaker Gillette of the House signed the bill accompanied by many feminine handshakes. Vice President Marshall performed the same function for the Senate. It's no coincidence that the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution codifying women's suffrage came directly after the 18th Amendment banning the production and sale of intoxicating liquors. At the start of the 20th century, consumption was only a shadow of the seven gallons of pure alcohol per person in the year 1830. Between 1900 and 1915, the average hung around 2.5 gallons per person per year, still about a dozen drinks per week. But those declines weren't enough to stop the burgeoning temperance movement. On January 16th, 1919, the 18th Amendment to the United United States Constitution was ratified. The prohibition of the manufacture, sale, or transportation of alcohol was the law of the land. Every day we'll be 
But it wasn't to last even 15 years. Enforcement of prohibition was spotty at best, arguably led to a wild increase in organized crime, and alleviated none of the vice and poverty advocates had promised. The 21st Amendment, which repealed prohibition, was ratified on December 5th, 1933. Thereafter, American consumption of alcohol resumed at a reported level under the pre-prohibition era, peaking again at two and three-quarter gallons of pure alcohol in 1981. American drinking dwindled modestly since, dropping in the 90s to just over two gallons per person per year. The most recent data I could find suggests people drink about two and a third gallons per year, roughly 10 drinks each week on average. That's far from ideal, but not the drunken republic that 19th century writers described. And this is where I got stuck in the story. It's every writer's nightmare. You ask, why does this matter? And you don't know. It's why I'm sitting in this chair and not in the chair I recorded this video originally in. I talked about outsized alcohol consumption in the 19th century, efforts to tame it, and its eventual taming. So what? I felt distant from this subject. I've been lucky enough in life to not have a disordered relationship with alcohol, and so I didn't really see myself in the story. 19th century drunkards, it's uh, more of a curiosity than a humanization of the past. Illustrate the quantities consumed, talk about poor access to safe drinking water, laugh at the anecdotes of babies getting rum, sucks to get hooked early, not much more to add. But I got up one morning after binge eating and purging, something I've struggled with as long as I can remember. I stepped on the scale and saw that not only had I already gained like five or six pounds since the start of the year, but by binging salty, fatty food the previous evening, the scale was showing an even worse number. For anyone who's ever had this experience, you know it can mess up your day. It can spiral and mess up a week, a month. Hell, once I didn't upload to this YouTube channel for like 20 months, in large part due to shame of showing myself, my body, on camera. And standing up on that scale, my brain made a first draft of an idea, a fairly crude idea. We're not drunk now, we're fat. As drunkenness has gone down, we've substituted other substances. But like I said, it was just a crude first draft. And I felt disrespectful comparing disordered alcohol consumption to disordered eating. Comparing alcoholism to opioid addiction didn't really feel right either. Every experience is unique. The second draft in my head looked for an explanation. What are we soothing with consumption, be it 1800s, 1900s, 21st century? A character in Upton Sinclair's 1906 book, The Jungle, spends his earnings from a Chicago slaughterhouse in a nearby pub on liquor that warms the core and numbs the industrial misery. Maybe there's a comparison. In grad school, a professor introduced us to a Rolling Stones song uh, from 1966, Mother's Little Helper about a stressed housewife. It goes like this. Um, Mother needs something today to calm her down. And though she's not really ill, there's a little yellow pill. She goes running for the shelter of mother's little helper. Yes, the Rolling Stones were from the UK, but I, I think the song applies. It's about soothing modern life with Valium, pills. That soothing was facilitated and exploited by all sorts of prescriptions in the ensuing decades up to today. And I bring it back to myself, not to minimize others' addictions, but just to empathize. When I'm overworked and feeling unhappy, I don't soothe with liquor or pills, I soothe with food. I've turned to fast food for decades. Junk, fries, fountain drinks, it lets out just a bit of dopamine calms me down just a tad, and then I plot along with modern life. Maybe we're connected through time through our need to soothe. That's rough draft number two. I also consider the things that we tend to consume are the things that are the most available, sometimes by design. Liquor was cheap, pills come for the price of your insurance, copay, sugar, salt, and fat are the most affordable parts of diet now. The things we use to poison ourselves are the things most available. Again, not groundbreaking thinking. But here's rough draft three, and you're welcome to refine it below. The thing that connects all these disordered consumptions is our Puritan approach to one another. Puritan beliefs fueled many of the earliest Europeans who came to America, and it surely influenced the religious zeal temperance activists had when it came to prohibiting alcohol. Overconsumption of liquor was a weakness, a sin, one to be dealt with through abstention and repenting. Alcoholics Anonymous, repent, abstain. The general attitude towards drug addiction was that way for a long time as well. Addiction to drugs, to pills, was individual weakness. Weakness to be dealt with through abstention and repenting. Narcotics Anonymous, repent, abstain, 
When it comes to my own vice, uh, binging, overeating, that attitude prevails as well. Uh, overeaters, anonymous, repent, abstain. That centuries-old American puritanism feeds my self-loathing. I'm sure society does judge me for my weight, but there's no harsher judge than me. I should be stronger, abstain, and repent. I'm addicted, disordered, and I can empathize with Americans, anyone who has struggled with overconsumption of any kind at any time. Experiences aren't the same. Many are obviously far worse than mine, no doubt. But I relate. And now the alcohol anecdotes at the start of this video, 13 drinks a day, babies getting rum, it all just doesn't seem that funny to me. The sources I encountered researching this video treated America's historic problem with alcohol as a quaint novelty. But our alcohol problem wasn't quaint. It was dark. And prohibition wasn't a weirdo overreaction. It was a Puritan reaction, the same ineffective reaction we have to all our problems. Here's to hoping for future generations that we find a happier balance between the anarchy of individualism and the Puritan sledgehammer. It's a mocktail. Later, y'all.